An outstanding publication from Harvard provides strong evidence for what has long been suspected that Epstein-Barr virus causes multiple sclerosis. Today I'm going to show you the details of the publication and we'll turn to three potential future treatments of MS that target Epstein-Barr virus and could treat or potentially eradicate MS. Remember what Einstein said, learn from yesterday, live for today, and hope for tomorrow. Let's have some fun. We'll start with a little background on Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV. It turns out the virus is everywhere. About 95% of adults are infected with it, whether they have symptoms or not, usually not. It's known as the so-called kissing disease because it's easily transmitted by saliva, and it initially infects epithelial cells, such as in the tonsils, but it later infects the B lymphocytes of the immune system, and that's how it contributes to the risk of multiple sclerosis. When young kids get EBV, they usually have no symptoms, but older people, adolescents and young adults can often have symptoms such as severe sleepiness known as mono or mononucleosis or sometimes swollen lymph nodes and that's why it's called glandular fever in some parts of the world. Even though the immune system shuts it down it persists in the body forever though we develop antibodies and there are a lot of different antibodies and that's how we kind of know the stage of infection the acute or chronic phase which we'll talk about a little bit later. One such antibody is anti-EBNA1 which develops around two to four months afterwards and persists forever, even decades later. It turns out it's not so much the antibodies, but rather the cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells, which control Epstein-Barr virus. And EBV is actually linked to other diseases other than MS, such as nasopharyngeal carcinoma and Burkitt's lymphoma. Interestingly, Burkitt's lymphoma is more common closer to the equator, the opposite of MS, likely due to other factors such as the prevalence of AIDS. So it's well known that people who get clinical mono have double the risk of getting MS later in life. But why? Why would a virus increase the risk of an autoimmune disease? Well, it turns out that EBV infects memory B lymphocytes, the cells that make antibodies, and it changes their regulations so they're immortalized and immune to CD25 positive suppressor T cells. It also can break down the blood-brain barrier, the barrier between the blood and the central nervous system known to be important in immune cell regulation and EBV infected B cells do more than just create antibodies. They also present antigens such as proteins from myelin like MOG, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, and they present those proteins to other immune cells such as CD8 positive T cells. Although 95% of people in the general population have EBV, some case series show 100% of people with MS have evidence of exposure to prior epilepsy. Bar virus, so it's sort of a necessary but not sufficient cause of MS. In other words, if you have EBV, you probably won't get MS, but if you don't have EBV, you almost certainly will not get MS. One meta-analysis found that 96% of studies found a link between mono and MS, and many of those that didn't were smaller with a small sample size or had other methodological problems. It's thought that part of the progression in people who have progressive MS could be related to a low-level inflammation mediated by B lymphocytes forming follicles within the meninges. As you can see here on an autopsy study, many people with progressive MS have such lymphoid follicles and some of these B cells are actually infected with EBV. So for years, many have suspected that EBV is the cause of MS, or at least part of the causal pathway of MS. But this study from Harvard provides the strongest evidence yet, and I want to give credit to senior author Dr. Alberto Escheria for this excellent publication. So they did a study in the U.S. military, and they had a huge cohort of young adults, which is perfect for studying risk factors for multiple sclerosis because it's a disease with an average average age of diagnosis of 30. So you want to look at young people. And they had over 10 million young adults on active duty. And it was a 20-year study between 1993 and 2013. And amongst those individuals, they had 955 new diagnoses of MS during the period of service. And I'll tell you the top line results. The risk of getting MS increased 32-fold after getting infected with EBV. They also looked at a lot of other viruses, cytomegaloviruses, other childhood viruses, and there was no such association. That strongly argues against the idea that this is some sort of secondary epiphenomenon, that people with MS have a different antibody response to all viruses. That is simply not the case. 
Another thing they looked at is serum neurofilament light chain. This is a marker in the blood that detects injury to the central nervous system. It's not specific to MS, but people with MS typically have elevations of serum neurofilament and it increases more with more MS progression and during relapses. And importantly, it increases prior to clinical onset and diagnosis of MS by up to six years. And they found out that people who got MS had elevated serum neurofilament light chain, which of course makes sense. But this occurred only after EBV seroconversion. In other words, only after they got the virus. Again, that suggests that EBV is the cause rather than some sort of secondary phenomenon, just the timing of the events. Now, let's look at the results. As I said, most people are EBV positive. So only 5.3% of the recruits were EBV negative. So the other 94.7%, they were already positive. Let's forget about them for a moment. Then they took the cases of people who got MS and they did a case control study matching them to two randomly selected individuals without MS of the same age, sex, race, ethnicity, branch of military service, and the date of collection of the blood samples. So they had a total of 801 people with MS and 1,566 controls. There were a few overlapping controls. Only one out of the 801 people with MS tested negative for EBV the entire time. In other words, of the 801, they all tested positive for EBV except one person. So that's incredibly strong evidence. And of course, that has been reported before. And keep in mind that clinical diagnosis of MS is not 100% accurate. There's misdiagnosis and no blood test is 100% accurate. I don't know the details of the one person who was EBV negative and got MS anyway. That's very unusual. They don't talk about that in the article. Another thing to note is that it was very delayed. The median time from the first EBV positive sample to clinical onset of MS was five years. And that makes a lot of sense because it's like you get the virus, it gets into your B lymphocytes, it changes their immune regulation, and then over time that contributes to the risk of MS. Now one caveat here is this is the US military, so the demographics of the study don't really match the demographics of MS overall. So it was 67% men in the study. Obviously MS is a predominantly female disease with about 75 5% of people with the diagnosis being female. As I said earlier, most people were young when they entered the study, so 78% less than age 26, which is good. And the ethnicities were not perfectly represented, a lot of white and black people, but other ethnicities not really represented very well. Although for both sexes and every ethnicity study, there seems to be a clear link between EBV and MS. So I think the results of the study are applicable to pretty much everyone, most likely. And you can see this is the distribution of the age of first sample in green and the age of MS onset in blue. And so for the most part, they were drawing blood on people prior to the symptom onset, or at least disease diagnosis of MS. Now let's look at the results in graphical form. These are people who originally tested negative for EBV. And so at the beginning, percent seropositive, 0%. And let's look at the people who got MS in the green line and people who did not get MS in the blue line and see who converted to EBV positive. And you can see for people who didn't get MS, it was 57%. So most people did get exposed eventually. The virus is everywhere. What can you say. But what about people who got MS? It was 97%. Everyone except one person. A highly statistically significant difference, which essentially means if you're EBV negative, you're probably not going to get MS unless you convert to positive. What about for other viruses? Is this true for other viruses such as cytomegalovirus, CMV? Absolutely not. You can see no difference between people who got MS and people who didn't get MS. It doesn't matter if you're exposed to CMV or not. It's unique to Epstein-Barr virus. What about the relative risk for people who get EBV versus those who didn't? So amongst people who tested negative and stayed negative the whole time, only one person got multiple sclerosis. If you look at people who later got Epstein-Barr virus, there was a 32-fold increased risk of MS. What about people who were EBV positive at the beginning, but didn't have MS at the beginning? They had a 26-fold increased risk of MS. In other words, it doesn't matter when you get EBV, it's a risk factor for MS, essentially. 
Another way to look at it, if you take everyone who tested negative for EBV at the beginning, who eventually got multiple sclerosis, how many of them converted to positive prior to the diagnosis? So EBV negative is represented by the green dot, the blue dot is EBV positive, and the orange dot is multiple sclerosis onset. And you can see sometimes people had like a 20 year delay from entering the military to getting multiple sclerosis. And if you look at the distance between the blue dot and the orange dot, from turning EBV positive to getting MS, it could easily be a 10 year delay or more. And obviously the blue dot is just when they were tested, they may have had the virus years earlier. The point is out of the 35 people, 34 of them out of 35 converted to EBV positive first. There was just one person you can see who did not. And I would be very interested to know the clinical details of this one individual and if they really genuinely had multiple sclerosis and if the blood test was actually accurate. I mentioned serum neurofilament light chain before and I want to show you it in graphical form. Now they looked at within person changes in serum neurofilament and the reason for that is there's a lot of fluctuation from person to person so it's really better to look at change in the level rather than the absolute level. So let's start on the right with the blue line in people who did not have multiple sclerosis. You can see there was really no change before, during, or after Epstein-Barr virus infection. Again, these are people who did not develop multiple sclerosis. But then let's look at the green line, people who did develop MS. You can see prior to EBV, and then after infection, it goes up dramatically. And again, this is a sign of central nervous system injury, which often precedes clinical symptoms or diagnosis of MS by years. But look around the time of Epstein-Barr virus infection. And this is inferred by the, the nature of the antibodies detected. They change with acute and chronic infection beyond the scope of this video. But just take my word for it, around the time of infection, there was no change in serum neuro filament light chain. In other words, the pathophysiologic changes of multiple sclerosis have not yet occurred because it takes time for Epstein-Barr virus to infect the B lymphocytes, change the immune system regulation, and only years later do you start getting these changes, which still may be before the actual clinical symptoms. And that strongly suggests that EBV infection must occur prior to multiple sclerosis. Otherwise, we might see some elevation of ser serum neurofilament light chain prior to EBV infection, which we do not. Now let's go back in time for a moment. I want to show you a publication, JAMA 2005, and I give credit to Professor Gavin Giovannoni for posting this on Twitter. I was otherwise unaware of the article. And it shows that it's not just whether you're positive or negative, but maybe the activity of the virus that is causing multiple sclerosis. Now, the background here is that when you have a stronger infection, more viral activity, you're likely to generate a stronger antibody response. For example, people who get severe COVID-19 with pneumonia are likely to get really high levels of antibodies that take a long time to go away, and they may have immunity for a long time, whereas people who have asymptomatic COVID-19, they may have lower levels of antibodies which go away, and they're more likely to get reinfected. The same thing is true with the JC virus, the virus that causes PML associated with the multiple sclerosis drug Tysabri, it's known that if you have a higher JC virus antibody index, you have a greater risk of getting PML as a complication of the drug. This is sort of counterintuitive. You would think that more antibodies means more protection against the virus, but it's actually sort of a reflection of higher viral replication or higher viral load. But anyways, let's take a look at this study on 3 million U.S. military personnel with blood samples samples collected between 1988 and 2000. And they broke it down into different ages. And you can see the filled in circle is the cases, people who got multiple sclerosis, and the empty circle is the controls, people who did not get multiple sclerosis. And you're looking at the geometric mean titer of anti-Epstein-Barr virus antibodies. Now, less than age 20, there was no difference, but probably relatively few people had MS. So let's forget about that for a moment. But for every other age group, there was a statistically significant difference between the level of antibodies against Epstein-Barr virus and risk of multiple sclerosis, whether you had MS or not. So it's not just having EBV or not, but the level of the antibodies. Higher antibodies, which suggest higher viral activity, greater risk of multiple sclerosis. And that makes sense because it's not just whether or not you have the virus latent in the body, but whether or not it's replicating and infecting B cells and causing immune system dysregulation. 
Now you could look at it in a different way. Forget about age. Let's just look at the level of the anti-EBNA complex. And you can look at the titer. So titers are essentially serial dilution. The idea is there's a lot of nonspecific binding of antibodies. So you have to dilute the sample many fold to make the nonspecific binding go away. So 80 means one part sample, 80 fold, 80 part saline. 640 means one part sample, 640 part saline. So you just keep diluting it until you get to that level. And you can see higher titers correspond with higher risk of multiple sclerosis. So people with a positive titer at greater than 1280 dilution had 9.4 fold increase risk of multiple sclerosis. And look how linear it is. Every increase in the titer essentially creates an increased risk of multiple sclerosis. Again, this strongly suggests that it's level of activity of the virus that is increasing the risk. Now I'm cherry picking here, but let's look at not just the level of the antibodies, but how they change over time. So let's forget about the actual titer and just look at people who had an increased titer of fourfold. So for US military recruits with a first sample collected prior to age 20, who had a full fourfold increase in their EBNA complex antibodies, what was their increased risk of MS? 17.6 fold increased risk of MS, regardless of their original titer. In other words, increasing antibodies increases the risk of MS dramatically, regardless of the individual titer. Again, this suggests you have to have activity of EBV prior to getting MS. That really strongly suggests that it is the cause. So putting it all together, I think the evidence is very convincing that EBV is part of the causal pathway of MS. And perhaps if we can treat EBV or ideally prevent EBV, maybe we could significantly decrease the prevalence of MS. But how can we do it? Right now, we're suppressing the immune system arguably like fools. I'll give you three ideas. The first is antiviral medications. For example, this medication tenofovir, which is used for hepatitis B and HIV, was found in in vitro studies to inhibit EBV DNA replication. Now we have to be careful with this. This is an in vitro a cell culture study. It doesn't necessarily pan out in humans with real diseases. We learned that from hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19, but it's preliminary and maybe if not tenofovir, some other antiviral medication. And some of these antivirals actually are relatively well tolerated and can be taken for long periods of time as in HIV. What about an immune-based therapy? This is a very interesting compound being developed by Ataro Biotherapeutics, ATA-188. It's an immune-based therapies where T cells are stimulated to fight the virus. And they have very good in vitro data. And they completed a phase one study in people with progressive MS. And nine out of 24 people in the study had improvement in their disability measured by EDSS or expanded disability status scale. Now, the results were not overwhelming. And this is a open label study, not randomized. However, they are going forward with a phase two study in people with MS called Embold, also people with progressive MS. And I'll include a link in the description below if you want to check it out. Moving on, perhaps the ultimate way to prevent multiple sclerosis is to develop a vaccine against EBV. People have talked about this for years, not just because of MS, but also because of nasopharyngeal carcinoma and Burkitt's lymphoma, as I mentioned at the beginning. And Moderna, the same company that developed a successful COVID-19 vaccine, is starting a phase one safety trial for an EBV vaccine, which could potentially prevent multiple sclerosis. Now, I'll tell you right now, we're not going to learn a ton from this study. It's a small study just to make sure the vaccine is safe and doesn't cause major side effects. They're looking for people age 18 to 30 who are healthy, in other words, without MS. But if you have a relative that's under age 30, maybe that is at increased risk of MS because they're related to you and you want them to enroll, I'll include the link below. Anyways, I hope you found this talk useful, hopefully in the future, perhaps the distant future, but maybe not too far away we can deploy these treatments that target Epstein-Barr virus rather than the immune system, and we may have excellent results. I'd be interested to know, have you had Epstein-Barr virus? Have you had clinical mono? And are you interested in any of these studies? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?